It's an enormous privilege for us to be able to talk to you about the Les and Millie Paris collection, which is currently on view at Art and Object and going to auction next week on the evenings of the 19th and 20th of September. Now, the entire catalogue is online, of course, at www.artandobject.co.nz. We're going to be on view this weekend from 11 till 4. Have a look online and in the catalogue to find out about the wonderful public programs and speeches we have this weekend. Uh, it's something that we do from time to time, and you'll have a chance to meet Millie this weekend, see the catalogue for the start times. And now Ben and I are going to talk about just some of the, the many fabulous works in this incredible collection. The last couple of months I've pretty much spent almost entirely in the uh, company of the collection and works from the collection. And having just sort of completed hanging and getting ready to, to go on view, it feels great, but it does feel slightly decontextualised in relationship to seeing them in the Paris family home. All of the works have such wonderful stories um, and, you know, the last thing I want to do is sort of pick out the most sort of iconic or the most valuable. really like to focus on some of the most special works or some of the works which, which Millie in particular is very close to. And one of these is Michael Lindlingworth's 1965 painting as Adam and Eve. It's a painting which, as you'll see in your catalogue, probably has one of the most impressive histories publication records. It feels very much part of our, the fabric of our national culture. It was uh, painted in 1965, um, exhibited a year or two after that in Barry Lett galleries, at which point there were several protests about the content of the work, specifically of course about the enlarged genitalia. And from there it had a little break from the market um, and from being uh, seen, and a break from public discourse until 1976 when it was exhibited the Pakaranga Art Society, at which point in time it was seized by police. Les Paris has kept the most wonderful records and one of his filing cabinets when I was doing a little bit of research, I came across every single letter to the editor complaining about the content of this work. And there was letters from the editor in support of the work from people like Michael Illingworth and uh, Dennis Cohn, of course, the Auckland art dealer, and then obviously far more letters uh, criticising the work and the content of the work. And uh, it's just an absolutely fascinating painting. This, the thing I always remember about it is, is Millie saying when they bought the work, they had to hung it in their, in their bedroom in the quiet there for 25 or 30 years, and they didn't bring it out until the 1990s because they basically felt that society wasn't ready for it. They didn't want to be stigmatised for, for owning this painting. So uh, a fantastic painting, but uh, absolutely wonderful history. This work by Michael Smither, Joseph with Beer and Bottle from 1973, is one of the more visible, if you like, and well-known paintings in the Paris collection. It featured way back in 1977 on the cover of Art New Zealand. It's a work that really reveals the genius of Michael Smither, and it's part of a body of work by Michael Smither that documents fundamentally the intimacies of family life. Here we have young Joseph uh, with his comforting teddy bear uh, just stopping in the hallway, pointing to the unknown, the void, the darkness beyond, which for a small child uh, must seem like a moment of foreboding. But we as the adult, uh, a proxy for the parent, of course, are seeing this moment and we give comfort and succour and we're able to communicate to the child that all is well. Another aspect of this particular painting and a number of Smithers paintings is that the figure of the child is monumental. So this monumentalization of the childhood experience is what gives these Smither paintings their power. As well as that, of course, we have the beguiling way with paint that is unique to Smither, these lovely round sculptural modulated forms these shots of colour, the yellow and the red, that up close, as well as at a distance, make this a very powerful and well-planned painting. Like Smither, Brent Wong is a painter who dazzles with the virtuosity of his paint application. Uh, Brent Wong literally burst onto the New Zealand art scene in the late 1960s and early 1970s, and he's an artist for whom uh, there is really no precedent. We see in Wong's work at this time, I think, two things. There is this, this mesmerizing, dazzling, uh, blue, rich palette, the perfectly modulated sculptural clouds, uh, this landscape, which of course is most probably a New Zealand landscape, but is very much emblematic for a peopleless landscape, uh, and in that sense it's universal. But of course these paintings are dominated 
by these extraordinary architectural creations that we call, we call them monoliths, uh, for want of a better word. They are hard-edged flying machines of one sort or another, and in this particular painting, Meantime Exposure, we have a sense of a call and response between this looming monolith here, which seems to have hove into view at slow, in slow motion, to potentially be t calling to or communicating to these earthbound remnants. These paintings of Wong's at this time uh, have a stillness and a quietness to them that on the one hand uh, is quite uh, foreboding, um, but they speak not of the desolation of an empty earth, but they talk to a sense of isolation, the idea that we are fundamentally alone. There's so many fantastic works in the Paris collection, it's, it's hard just to pick out uh, one or two really and elevate them above the others and talk about them, but a couple of works which deserve special mention uh, by virtue of their place in their collection, uh, their rarity and their importance are undoubtedly these two paintings by Gordon Walters. The one on the right is entitled Makoya, it dates from 1965 to 75. So obviously uh, a painting the artist spent some time with. And then the one on the left dates to 1965, the same year as McCoy was begun. Taken together, they do a lot to explain the significance of Walters, but also the manner in which he was able to extrapolate uh, so much value from the Māori kuru motif, which he abstracted down into effectively what was a bar and a dot. He worked with the motif for over 30 years and uh, these two paintings are among his finest. Walter's uh, methodology was incredibly fastidious and very, very, very detailed. He'd effectively start with a, uh, a paper collage in which he would lay out the design. From there, if he was happy with that, he would produce a, a working drawing, a gouache or an ink on paper, and then from there, that final stage, if he was happy with those, he would turn it into a fully uh, realised uh, oil painting. And uh, by the time he got to that point, all of the details of the craft, if you look closely in the works on paper, you'll notice um, fascinating details such as uh, drawn penciled lines, uh, the pricks of the compass, all that is gone by the time you get to this stage. You are left with completely and utterly the finished uh, product. One of the lots, uh, following on from talking about the two Walters oils, which for me goes a long way to showing why this collection is so special, why Les and Millie are, are such a rarity in terms of their commitment and dedication to collecting and living with art, uh, three works all entitled Caraca. Um, one is the screen print in an edition of 75. Uh, it turns up in auction catalogues from time to time. It's a classic uh, Walters Kuru image and a beautiful screen print. But what's really interesting is when Les and Millie purchased that, uh, that particular screen print in 1976 from Peter McLevy Gallery, they also bought the two working drawings for the screen print. Now we've split them up into three lots because you know, essentially we figure there's very few other collectors out there like Les and Millie who want to own uh, three works that relate to each other. But you'll find them in their catalogue, they're all purchased together. And the first one is a, is a beautiful little gouache and, and, and it was obviously Walters' starting point. And when you look close, it's, it's a little bit rough for Walters. There's the signs of the pricks of the compass, the drawn lines, the occasional rubbed out mark. And then from there, you go to the full black and white, fully realized A3 ink on paper, which almost serves as the exact template for the screen print. So just a sort of fascinating history and wonderful insight into an artist's practice that a collection as important as this gives you. Don Binney's Vanishing Wellington Bird of 1971 is a work that it we immediately recognise as a Don Binney painting. It has all the wonderful sensual hallmarks of his painting style, that unique almost lead-like outline in black which defines the forms and gives them that wonderful solidity. But it's also a work that is completely unique within his entire career. Because it's a work in which the bird here, in this case a stitch bird, has been removed. It is defined by its outline, its silhouette, um, but by its absence, and that is uh, by no means a random effect. Um, this work was specifically created to highlight the fact that at the time, the stitch bird, which had, in the 19th century, in Walter Buller's time, had been common in the hills of Wellington. Um, at this time, uh, it had vanished. This painting is a protest painting, and I think 
It's testimony to uh, Don Binning's role <clears throat> in highlighting these sorts of issues that we now have a counter trend taking place. Uh, that the stitch bird, in fact, has returned now after an absence uh, of almost a century to the hills of Wellington in the Zealandia uh, Natural Park there. But this particular work was created at a time when there was uh, the rising of the green movement in New Zealand. Uh, this painting, which was exhibited in 1971 at the opening of the Douse Gallery, so it has wonderful exhibition provenance, uh, also coincides with the period in which Don Binney and a number of other artists were very much highlighting conservation issues in New Zealand and habitat destruction. And that moment gave rise to the beginnings of the Green Movement in New Zealand in the form of the Values Party, uh, the first manifesto of which was created in 1971 in Wellington at Victoria University, where Don Binney was the resident painting fellow at that time. So some wonderful connections uh, in this particular work to some ideas and some concepts which we now uh, believe are fundamental to brand New Zealand. Peter Robinson would have to be one of my personal uh, favourite artists. I often think about his work and, and his relationship to the market like a, like a train chase and the market's like the police and the train robbers are, are leaving the station and every time the police catch up with uh, the train it gets further away and that feels very much to me like Peter Robinson's relationship to the, to the art market. Every time um, the market gets a grip on his work he produces something that's even more tougher, that's even more difficult, that's even more impossible to commodify. From giant works on butcher's paper stuck together with old bits of sellotape through to uh, his recent installation at the Sydney Biennale. He's an artist who, who produces great work um, for a serious audience and not for a market. In saying that, uh, we have a work here which is uh, an absolute ball terror sure if you can say ball terror, but I just did. Um, it's a work from 1997, uh, a classic Peter Robinson. It's done uh, on canvas, on an unstretched canvas, and uh, very few of his works are. Um, it relates to the same series as the work we had in the David and Angela Wright collection, except it's roughly about twice the scale. It is, of course, Boy Am I Scarred A. Peter Robinson is completed in the, in the classic Maori palette of black, red, and white. And uh, it features right in the centre this classic trademark thumbprint come kuru um, come parody of the design for our national institution to Papa Tonga Rera. And then as well as this, obviously it, uh, it references McCann and his small series called Boy Am I Scared. Robinson takes that phrase and adds in scarred of course and reverses the classic McCann I am into am I. And in doing so he just creates a fantastic work which is so so dense with meaning, so multi-layered, and uh, just so strong visually as well. Michael Stevenson is more latterly well known for his complex installations which examine often far-flung and seemingly disparate uh, economic and social relationships on a personal level. But before he began uh, these uh, complex installations, fundamentally sculptural works, uh, Michael Stevenson was a singular and beguiling painter. Uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Michael Stevenson created a really unique body of work in New Zealand art history that was located, if you like, in the small provincial world. And this particular work here, which was exhibited uh, in the travelling exhibition that went to Spain, Distance Looks Our Way, uh, is really uh, quite a touching work because it's a, of a wreath, a wreath that would have been placed on a gravestone for the unknown Kev. And we see in its humble materials there probably polystyrene or wooden lettering and the flowers and of course the poppy uh, and the letter, um, something that as New Zealanders we can all relate to because uh, it talks to the colonial experience in large measure. The third, fourth or fifth generation New Zealander uh, in the provinces in New Zealand trying to A, eke out a living, B, find meaning, and C, develop the traditions, uh, the sustaining traditions that bind communities together.